here. I appreciate this space, amen, um, and time, but it's Bible study time, amen. Um, just listening to all the testimonies is so very encouraging, amen. I heard Sister Smothers saying, why is this happening to me, amen? Oh, but Sister Smothers, I've been there with you. I've been there, and I was just talking to um, Missionary Burnett as well. I had, you know, been on this journey to buying a house, and you guys know what the market is like, and every house seemed like, you know, we fell in love with some cash buyer would come in right behind us. And it, there's just no way you could go in if you're going to be financed. Amen. I mean, if I had a million five on me, I'd just drop it. Right. But I don't. So I am not emptying my, you know, my retirement savings for something that I'm going to have to just used to be a hole in your pocket, trying to fix it up and all those things. And I said, you know what, Lord, I know I hear you, you know, when you're ready. But as soon as I got to that space where I'm like, oh, but Lord, I heard what you said. Amen. Sometimes you hear what God said and we run with it. Amen. He may not mean it for that very moment, but he means that prepare for that season. Amen. And I know what that means. And I said, OK, well, I need to get to Hayward, Lord. I, I went to um, a couple places and I'm like, there's just no way the closet won't work or this won't work. And I'm not one to settle. Amen. And so I this place popped up and it wasn't ready yet. And I called the agent and he said, well, um, it'll be ready, you know, on Monday. So just come up and meet me there to see it. I have to go up there anyway. And so I go up there, meet the agent and the owner. And I just fell in love with it. The view is amazing. And the owner said, just take it off the market. It's hers. You want it? And I said, yeah, I do. He said, don't even show it anymore. Didn't show it anymore. Sent me the lease. And told me, give me the deposit whenever it's, whenever you got time, you know, and just let me know when you want to move in. You can pick up the keys whenever. I said, if that's not like God, if that's not like God, and the agent was saying, you know, when we get the owner's approval, and I'm like, dude, the owner approved it in your face. I don't know where you were, but I was there. <laughs> And so it's hard for those who aren't in Christ to see what God said when we see it in the spirit and we hear what God has told us. It's hard for those that are not in Christ to see that. And so, you know, with that, I'm just going to begin. We're talking about fellowship. Amen. And fellowship is absolutely important for all of us. I want all of you tonight that can type in the chat the power of unity. Just go ahead and type in the chat, the power of unity. Last week and this week, we're talking about the power of unity. When we all get together, amen. I don't have as much courage as uh, Deaconess Mothers or First Lady, so I'm not going to sing that song when we all get together. What a day it will be, amen. Uh, when we all see Jesus, amen. I love that song. But we're going to start talking about the power of unity, amen. The power of unity. Keep that in your hearts. Amen. Here's my old school song for you guys. Do you love the Lord? Do you love everybody? If you love him, stand on your feet and give him a hand clap, everybody. It's a salute. To Reverend Clay Evans, Miss Ludella, and Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church, musical history. Put your hands together. Everybody. Put your hands together, y'all.
ship. What a ship, what a ship. It's a kinship. Friendship. It's a relationship. And all that means is what? What a fellowship. Are you on board? I say, are you on board? Put those hands together. Amen. Amen. What a fellowship. Amen. Lean on Jesus. Amen. That is what fellowship is all about. We'll get into that in just a moment. Amen. I hope you enjoy friendship, kinship, kingdomship. Amen. The power of unity. You'll remember this from last week. Amen. This is absolutely critical that we get the importance of unity and oneness. Amen. Why do we fellowship? Why do we fellowship? You can quickly unmute or type in the chat. Why do we fellowship? It gives us strength and unity among each other. And being it makes us stronger when we're together. You know how pastor always say we're better together and, and we're stronger when we come together in unity. You could grow learn and grow too when we come into the sanctuary together because you come to church not knowing something and you leave church knowing a whole lot and and good things so i think it's yeah it gives amen. us a lot of strength amen strength sister Sybil typed in the chat to build relationships with each other pastor says we support one another and sharpen each other amen why do we fellowship keep that in your heart as we go through um, the word, as we see what God says. Amen. Um, Deacon Art, to build each other up in Christ. Iron sharpens iron. Yes, sir, it does. Amen. So the power of unity, the significance of fellowship. Amen. I'm going to read this, but I want you to get it. There is some scriptures in here that will help um, that will help uphold the statements that are being made. Amen. I didn't really want to get into the definitions and the Greek definitions and all of those, but just know that there is basis for the significance of fellowship to appreciate the full meaning of the word group in the New Testament that conveys the nature and reality of Christian fellowship. There is the noun, um, koinia, and Acts 242, you'll see that word used. Um, for Christian fellowship, the verb, um, kioninen, I had my Siri say these words, so I say I'm right, <laughs> amen, Hebrews 2, um, 14, and the now uh, koinos, um, Luke 2, 14, as used in the New Testament, amen, so you can see the, the background word, the basis word for fellowship in the Greek and how it's used in the Bible to connect each of us on this Christian journey. Amen. Um, also, um, the fact and experience of Christian fellowship only exists. Listen to this. So when you're wondering why we did it last week, we talked about the building. Amen. And we talked about the building being a physical representation of our spiritual connection to the body of Christ. Amen. We talked about that, that spiritual aspect of why we go into a building and what that building represents. It's in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And once you get that spiritual understanding of what that physical building means, then it'll help you understand why we actually go into a building to have church. Yes, we are a church. Yes, our body is a building. Amen. But we have a physical representation that allows us to fellowship. Amen. Together with like-minded. The fact and experience of Christian fellowship only exists because God the Father, through Jesus Christ, the Son and by in the Spirit has established in grace a relation 
a new covenant, amen? Someone type in the chat, a new covenant, amen, with humankind. Those who believe the gospel of the resurrection are united in the spirit through the son of the father, to the son, through the son to the father. The relation leads to the reality of relatedness, right? Relatedness. I can relate to you. You can relate to me because we are a part of the same body. And thus to an experience relationship, a communion, so the Lord can commune with us. And he does that often through each other, amen, between man and God. And those who are thus in Christ, as the apostle Paul often states, are in communion, not only with Jesus Christ and the Father, in the spirit, but also with one another, amen? This relatedness, relationship, and communion is fellowship, amen? And so there is a, a book reference down at the bottom. Um, I have absolutely um, studied, amen? And I'm a reader, so, you know, pastor can tell you I'm a reader, and when I need understanding, I'll go back and I'll ask for the understanding. Um, but there are some really good books out there. Um, I will also use another one of my pastor phrases, eat the meat and spit out the bones. Amen. Eat the meat and spit out the bones. And the only way that you can do that is by studying God's word and fellowshipping with those. Amen. You should never be the smartest person in the circle. You should never, ever be the smartest person in the circle. Glean from those around you, amen? And um, Walter Elwell, Entry for Fellowship. Um, there's an evangel evangelical um, dictionary of the theology in there, but um, this is um, a book that really goes into um, the purpose um, of fellowship and entry to fellowship and how we get there. So here we go. True fellowship means sharing together in the things of God. True fellowship means sharing together in the things of God. Um, Philippians 1, 3 through 8 are the verses that we'll be using um, for the basis. Amen. Philippians 1, 3 through 8. I need everybody to get that, whether it's on your phone um, whether it's you have a Bible close to you, get Philippians 1, 3 through 8. Amen? Mm -hmm. um, praying for one another. So Philippians 1, verses 3 through 4. Does someone have that? Can you read Philippians 1, verses 3 through 4? I thank my God every time I remember you. And all my prayers for all of you are always pray with joy. Amen. Amen. And so there is other scriptures that you see um, right here. Ephesians 6, 18, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. We are always um, talking about that scripture. But praying for one another in fellowship is important because, you know, that stupid devil loves to sow seeds of discord in the church. You know, he just, he loves getting the saints all riled up at each other. But how many of you out there know it is terribly difficult to stay angry or hold an ought against somebody that you're constantly praying for? If that's true for you, if you're constantly praying for someone and it makes it hard for you to stay angry at them or hold an ought against them, just type in the chat, that's true for me. And if that's not true for you, just say, work on me. Type, work on me, Lord. Work on me. Amen. When you are praying without ceasing for your brethren, when you are constantly saying, Lord, I know that they are not my enemy. I am not your enemy. Amen. The devil comes seeking whom he may devour. Amen. He comes in as a lion. Amen. He's not a lion and he knows he's not a lion. He's already been defeated, but he comes in to incite that confusion, frustration, all of that discord. He comes in with gossip. He comes in making you think someone's talking about you or looking crazy at you. They're looking back at the door and you just happen to be sitting on the seat that's closest to the end by the door. And they're pointing outside because the leaves are on inside and you just swear they're talking about you. 
praying without ceasing. Amen. Praying without ceasing. When you are constantly praying for one another, it is terribly difficult to believe some hearsay or to believe some gospel some gossip. Amen. Serving God together. Somebody get Philippians 1, 5 for me. 1, 5, and then you can drop down to 7. We're going to read 7 twice, but does someone have Philippians 1, 5? Serving God together. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now is number 5, and then go down to 8. 7. Oh, seven. I'm sorry. Um, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, it is much as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. Amen. Missionary Hooker, I love hearing your voice. I miss you so much. Amen. I miss you too. Serve <laughs> Serving God together. Amen. That's fellowship. Serving God together. We're out doing missions. We're going to all be out at the park. Every single one of us is a minister when we rocking in the park. Amen. Every single one of us is our job to minister because everybody has eyes in different places. Amen. There's someone walking up from the park area. There's someone walking up from the street. There's someone that just stop in the middle of the grass wondering what it is we're doing. We are all ministers serving God together. Amen. That's a fellowship. Trusting in God's sovereign working in one and one another. Amen. Philippians 1 and 6. How amazing would it be if we all simply trusted God's sovereign working in one another? We just went through testimony service. Amen. If we can just trust the God that's in the other, amen? Somebody type in the chat, I trust the God in you. Amen, we gotta trust God. This really isn't about us, it's about God, amen? Does someone have Philippians 1 and 6? While you find that, go ahead and just type, I trust the God in you, amen? Being confident of this very thing, that he who hath begun a good work in you yes. will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Complete that good work in you. I believe that God is completing his good work in you. He is perfecting you. Amen. I was working with um, the realtor for this place and he said, why are you so easy to work with? And I said, you know, I have to, I don't understand what you do and you don't understand what I do. So I have to trust that you are good at what you do. I have to trust that you know what you're doing. And if it doesn't make sense to me, then I'm going to ask you for understanding. Amen. Some people will get angry because they don't understand something. I'm not in real estate, never studied it. It's not my job to understand it. So I'm going to ask the question. Amen. And I'm not going to get angry because I didn't understand it the first time around. Amen. Trusting in God's sovereign working in one another. Now we're going to go back to Philippians 1 and 7. Can someone get that partaking together of God's grace? Someone get Philippians 1 and 7 and read that. Amen. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, insomuch as both in my bonds, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of my grace. That is amazing. Thank you, sir. We are all. Somebody type all. A-L-L. -L, and that's all. We are all. He didn't say, except for the brother that took your parking space in the church parking lot. Now you blocked in. He didn't say, except for that sister that wore the same dress that you wore and she knew you was going to wear it. All. He said, all partaking together of God's grace. Amen. All of the saints, all of those who are a part of the body. Amen. This book was written to the saints. Amen. All partaking together God's grace, the significance of fellowship 
These are all of those things that connects us. This is why we fellowship. This is why we are together. We share all of these things in common. There should not be one person that goes through this Bible study that does not understand what it is that you have in common with your other brother or sister. Amen. We partake together in God's grace. Amen. Heartfelt affection for one another. This is my favorite part. Can someone read Philippians 1 through 8? Read it like Paul wrote it with passion. If Philippians for 1. God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Hmm. How heartfelt, heartfelt affection. Amen. Could you imagine if we had that heartfelt affection for one another all the time, in spite of all of the junk, in spite of all of our differences, that heartfelt affection. Somebody tell me what heartfelt affection means to them. Give me your definition. You can either put it in the chat or unmute. Heartfelt affection for one another. What does that mean to you? Um, it's me, Sister Sibba. When you feel what your brother and sister is going through and what they have to face when you understand that. Amen. Amen. And you have compassion on them. You're going to stick by them. You're going to encourage them. You're going to be their cheerleader to the end. Absolutely. Absolutely, Sister Sybil. Anyone else? Heartfelt affection. What does that mean for you? Amen, Missionary Hooker. Even if I don't see someone for a long time, when I see them, it's like a moment hasn't even passed between us. Mm. Amen. Heartfelt affection. Now this one, Proverbs 16, 19. I'm going to take a second for you all to turn to Proverbs 6. Turn to Proverbs 6. And we're going to go to verses 16 through 19. Does someone have that? Missionary Burnett. Go ahead, Missionary Burnett. Proverbs 6, verse 16. Yes, through 19. 19. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yes. Yea, seven are an abomination yes. unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue. And hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Amen. And he who sows discord among brethren is the seventh. Right? It's a yea, seven are an abomination to him. Now we hear that word abomination and we will call out things like, you know, homosexuality. So when you're in the church, most of the time when we hear the word abomination, that's all I hear it being used for. That's the most frequent use of that phrase, abomination, is when they're preaching against homosexuality. Abomination, it's clear here in the Bible. Seven are an abomination. And he lists all of these things, but the seventh on this list is one who sows discord among the brethren. These things God hates. Amen. Here's a quote I thought was so relevant because I think about this scripture and I think about it if we are on this journey, if you're new on this journey, if you're young, if you're seasoned on this journey and you ever want to check yourself, here's your mirror. Proverbs 6, 16, 19. It's your mirror. Last week, someone sent a message that said x-ray. This is your x-ray machine. You want to check yourself? Here it is. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. Satan always hates Christian fellowship. It is his policy to keep Christians apart. Anything which can divide saints from one another, he delights in. 
he attaches far more importance to godly intercourse than we do. Since union is strength, he does his best to promote separation. That's a quote from Charles Spurgeon. The significance of fellowship. Fellowship and the power of unity is a weapon in our warfare against the enemy. His job, the devil's job, is to keep us from being unified because he knows where two or three are gathered. In the name of Jesus, God shall be there in the midst. Amen. And so be careful that you know who your enemy is. Your brethren and sister, they're not your enemy. Yes, there are some behaviors that you don't care for. Yes, maybe they did say something out of turn or they said something that you didn't take lightly to, amen? But they are not your enemy. It is not your job to go back and try to correct what they said or did you say or did he say or how they said it. That is not your job, amen? Your job is unity, amen? Any comments or questions? I see a comment that says, that's why he causes disruption and discord amongst the saints. Amen. The more you know this word, the more you understand what the enemy's plan is. Amen. Fellowshipping is us being on a team. That's us getting together at Bible study. The Bible is our game plan. The Bible is us looking at the opposer understanding what the opposer is going to do next. Amen. It's just like basketball or football or soccer or hockey, any of those sports, knowing what the opposer is going to do next helps us with our weapons and our, our warfare chest. Amen. Amen. Any questions or comments, anything? I would say, uh, sis, this is so powerful because discord can mess up a great thing that God is trying to do in the ministry. Many times the enemy will come along with jealousies and insecurities and those kind of things, uh, dropping one thing in one person's ear. And, and often they don't even know that they're being uh, sowing seeds of discord. Glory to God. And it, it pulls away, it puts a hole in what God is trying to do in the life of many individuals. The Bible talks about the fact that we need to uh, admonish and encourage one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So he's requiring of us this. Amen. Amen. God bless you, sir. I also um, saw in the chat that says, we are not ignorant of his devices. No, we are not. We should not. We cannot be ignorant of the enemy's devices. Can I say one more thing? It seems like many times it's easy for us to see those things in other folk. But we have a reason to do it. And it's really not that. I'm just saying this because you know it's true. Um, and everything that's true doesn't need to be said. Amen. Amen. Everything that's true doesn't need to be said. I tell my kids all the time, just because it's in your head don't mean it needs to come out your mouth. Amen. So for our reflection, um, this is also get a pencil or a pen and a notebook. This is also homework. Amen. Look at the Solid Rock calendar of events. These are just a few. Um, dates subject to change. I think I got them right. Um, commit to at least two upcoming fellowships and invite someone, invite someone's, amen, to come along. Now, I was putting this together and we had done a little homework last time on a reflection where we thought about a testimony of fellowship, amen, where we fellowship and we connected or we fellowship and we grew from connecting with like-minded individuals or serving God together, amen, growing in grace together. But this time, I want you to look at the calendar and just commit, make a commitment. 
Now, in my in my mind, when I'm asking you to commit and to invite people in fellowship in my mind, I hear missionary Diana saying, you know, Sister Lanita, we we inviting people to fellowship, but what if we don't know how to do that? What if we don't know how to do that well? So shouldn't we prepare people? What does that mean? I always love talking to missionary Diana Hill Green because she provokes us to think, think things through. Um, and I always, I love that because sometimes I'll be in a hurry, hurry, hurry to do something and I don't think it through. So we're gonna go in that same vein, learning to fellowship well. So if I'm going to ask you to commit, to invite people to fellowship with us, let's learn to fellowship well, amen? In this particular slide, you can print this out and use this in your behaviors, whenever you're inviting someone, or even if you're in a grocery store, amen, and you see someone and you're compelled to pray for that person or with that person or evangelize to that person, that is a fellowship. So learning to fellowship well. Colossians 3, 12 through 14 says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, amen, meekness. Pastor says meekness is power under control, an iron fist and a velvet glove, amen. Long suffering. Someone type in the chat, long suffering, but type it like pastor say it, amen. Long suffering. Long, yes, sister mothers, that's how pastors say it. Type in the chat, long suffering. Amen. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. We have to grow there. Missionary Green, long suffering. Absolutely. And so long suffering, bearing with one another. Amen. After you type long suffering, somebody type bear with me. I need y'all to bear with me, amen? I'm not the easiest person to deal with all the time. Sometimes I'm laser focused and event planning or getting something done, or you know, I might be in touch a little too much, just checking and double checking. Y'all know I got my checklist and if it's not like it's on the checklist or if it's not on my calendar, it doesn't exist. Y'all type in the chat, bear with me. Bear with me, be patient with me, be long suffering with me and forgiving one another. Amen. It is very hard to keep an ought against someone or to be angry with someone or I don't like that person or I can't be in a room with that person if we are forgiving one another. If we are forgiving one another as God has forgiven us. Amen. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Amen. Put on love. And I love it. it says, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Now, some of us aren't as transparent in our testimonies. But on Sunday, if you missed Elder Smith, Lord have mercy, Jesus. Just the, the, the raw honesty blessed my soul. Amen. Because as Christ forgives us, as we're saying, Lord, I'm not going to do that. As we're saying, Lord, I know I've done this, this, and this. We heard a testimony earlier. The Lord says, be grateful because if I gave you what you deserved, you wouldn't be here. Amen. So just as Christ forgave you of all of that junk, I know some of us, you know, we got to think years and years back. But me, I probably got to think back half an hour of all the stuff that God has forgiven me for. Amen. How many times I walk around, oh, forgive me, Lord. Forgive my thoughts. Amen. So forgive me. Somebody type in the chat, forgive me. Please forgive me and be specific. Let's not do any of that candy coated forgiveness. Lord, forgive me because I said something about that sister in my heart 
Maybe I didn't verbalize it, but forgive me. God sees my heart and I know he sees it. If you go to a brother or sister and you're asking for forgiveness, forgive him for what? I, I can hear Missionary Burnett in my hand. Don't say, forgive me for whatever I might have done. <laughs> Missionary Burnett don't like that. Say what you did. Be honest. Amen. Amen. I see there's so much. Yes, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. Amen. God is just amazing. Create in me. I see you, Sister Stevenson. Forgive me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh Lord. That's what we need. But not only if we're going to go ask God to create in us a clean heart and renew within us the right spirit, then that wrong spirit that was in us, if that spirit offended somebody, go to that person that that spirit offended. You know, some of us still angry at our parents for some stuff that they did to us, whether they were present or not. You're angry at them for leaving. You're angry at them when they came back. You're angry at your sisters, your brothers, your cousins. You're angry at that sister that you just believe she came in and took your man or whatever, took your wife, whatever it is. You need to forgive that person as God has forgiven you. Amen. All of that junk. Let's peel that thing out. Let's go in there and say, God, dig that stuff out by the roots. Because sometimes you'll think that you put weed killer on that thing and you'd see that weed pop back up. That's because you sprayed the surface of it. You go in and you get that garden tool and you dig that thing up by the roots. You pull it all the way out. If you hear it tear, keep digging until God digs all of that stuff out of your heart. Amen. And so I want to make sure that I'm mindful of time and I really hope I can get through these. Amen. Um, lessons from Jesus's fellowships, according to Luke. So I figured, you know, we're talking about um, fellowshipping, right? And this word came in the New Testament. So I'm going to stick with lessons from the master. Amen. Dining with the enemies. Um, Luke 5, 27 through 32. Can someone get that for me? We won't read all of these scriptures because they're long, but we'll shorten them a bit. But someone please read Luke 5, 27 through 32. And while someone gets that, if you all have any comments, please let me know. Luke 5. Oh, go ahead, sir. I do have the uh, scripture. Okay. Luke 5, 27 through 32. Uh, yes. Would you want to like me to just read 27 for right now? Um, you can read 27 through 32. That's not that long. Okay. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he left all, rose up and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. Did y'all hear that? Dining with the enemy. So when you look back, and, and I couldn't give a history lesson, but I put these scriptures here because I want you to, to learn them. Um, in the, I have um, the YouVersion Bible app on my phone. Amen. And this Bible app, when I'm looking at these scriptures, it gives me a little box and that box will tell me corroborating scriptures that confirms the scripture that I just read. So if I'm going and I don't know if you all can see this, but if I'm on here, amen, there's a little dialogue box on verse 27. And if I pull up verse 27, it gives me corroborating scripture so that I can study it and make sure that this is a relevant scripture for the lesson. Amen. And just for my own understanding. So this is the YouVersion Bible app. Um, if you are not sure how to turn that um, feature on, um, you can go into the more button down here, the three lines at the very bottom. And I have an iPhone. 
and just click on your settings. And when you go to your settings, it'll ask you if you want to show that dialog box and just say, yes, give me that dialog box. If you need help, y'all can text me or call me and I'll walk you through it. But studying to show yourself approved, amen, is absolutely critical. And pray before you read anything so that God can open that thing up for you, amen. Dining with the enemy. My point here was, consider how you react to saints who invite, say, a loan shark or a known thief or drug dealer to church, amen. Prostitutes come and sit in the back and we so focused on the short dress that we can't focus on that soul, that heart that's coming to be saved. Amen. They knew where there was a safe place at. Amen. Do everything with wisdom. Let those seniors and elders of the church guide you. Amen. If God hasn't given you the wisdom to deal with those particular people. And do you know any enemies that need Jesus? Amen. Those publicans and tax collectors, absolutely in those days and times, you'll see um, you'll absolutely see in the Bible um, how bad they talked about the tax collectors. Amen. They were stealing and robbing. There's so many parables about the tax collectors going back and giving people four and five times what they had taken from them because God had hearkened their heart. What if God wanted to use you to bring one of your enemies to him? Or one of those enemies or kinds of people that you think should not be in the church. Amen. Somebody that you know lying all the time. That is just an enemy of your peace. Amen. But make sure you use wisdom in doing so. Amen. Consult with someone who you see are being fruitful in the church and dealing with these kinds of souls. Amen. Any questions or comments or concerns before we move on to the uninvited guests? Yes, I just had, uh, I guess I just wanted to uh, have a statement or just a quick discussion point. Like when we were, uh, like the uninvited guests that we were talking about. So now that is more of us taking or is that more of us like taking the word of God that we've uh, we've learned and we've received and God put on our spirits and we taking it out, I mean, into maybe like even like den of thieves or in places where maybe we're in environments where we're around those who may not know God or may not believe in God, but we spread the good word to them in the hopes that some someone or or some ones may take hold is that kind of what that is uh trying to describing so i i do want to be careful and i want to say this i hear you saying going kind of in a den of thieves i want to be careful um how I state this, because what we don't want to do is we don't want God to deliver us for something and we're delivered for five good minutes and, you know, from maybe we're delivered from drinking. We don't want to go on a bar if that thing is going to be a weight, a hindrance, if that thing is going to hinder us or if we may be tempted in that way. So we don't want to willfully put ourselves in harm's way to in the name of ministry. Amen. I know there are some things that, you know, to this day, I need to be careful. Um, for example, breaking up fights. Amen. Um, yeah. I have a past of fighting. And so I have to be careful with my temperament. If I think that I want to resolve a fight that I don't get into <laughs> the fight. Amen. So I would say there to be careful and use wisdom, always ask God. But in another instance, um, to answer your question, if we are out, say, at the park, and I've been delivered from, you know, being an alcoholic, and I see someone that's drunk that comes to the park that's standing there staggering, smelling of alcohol, because I have the saints around me, and I have support around me, I will ask somebody for help to come minister to that person. Pastor, do you have a, a clear answer or um, want to add? I, I don't to that know answer? that it could be a whole lot clearer, but that's exactly what I was where I was going to kind of come back and say we've got to be careful that we don't get you know 
two hours of salvation and we're filling our oats, we're filling the zeal, and then we go into a place uh, that's very slippery for us. And what we often ought to do, first of all, is difficult. You should not go into those kind of places by yourself. And as you said earlier, we need to consult somebody who we believe uh, is wise and who's walking with the Lord so they can help us uh, understand a way to go back, even to go back and clear up something that took place, um, took place with somebody else that was a harsh kind of an environment. Uh, you know, sometimes we got to consult somebody. I know the Bible says go to them and if they don't receive you. But before you go, think about it so that you don't go in with the wrong attitude. So you don't go in and, uh, with an accusatory kind of uh, approach and get rejected or, or have it thrown back at you. So somebody can share with you, you know, a way to kind of go do that. And maybe not this week, but maybe next week. Glory to God, maybe at another time when we have gotten to a place where it's not so hot anymore and we can talk about it without uh, stirring up a hornet's nest. But it's always good to talk to somebody and get counsel. There's safety in a multitude of counsel. And so it's so important for us to be careful how we go into those difficult situations. Uh, as you talked about, if, you've been, if you have issues with drinking or smoking weed or whatever, uh, that might not be the place where you want to go and hang out, stand outside the bar or go sit on the stool drinking. I'm going to drink Coke and then try and witness to the folks drinking. That might not be a good place. That's not a good place for you to go. Glory to God. And uh, if you if you had a situation where, you know, you, you uh, had a relationship and it broke up and now you want to go back and witness to them, glory to God, and you haven't gotten over them, that might take you back, back to a place where it's, un, it's not safe for you. So use wisdom. Amen. And the Holy Ghost will give you wisdom. You just ask. Absolutely. The Holy Ghost will give you wisdom. Um, and when those people come on your turf, um, that is a better opportunity um, to minister in safety. Amen. Um, the uninvited guests. I'm sorry, sir. Did that help? Yes, it did. Thank you so much. I appreciate you both. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Ms. Nair. I appreciate it. The uninvited guests. So when you look at Luke 7, 36 through 50, this is, you know, one of those. Um, parables that talk about, you know, the uh, women that we would frown upon and that the Pharisees and the Sadducees actually did frown upon um, in this scripture. I want you guys to go look at this. Um, and the Pharisees actually said, how dare you to Jesus? Like, why is he entertaining that woman? He knows she's not somebody he should entertain. Amen. And so here, I just um, want you to think about how you react to uninvited guests. Amen. You throw in your thing and it's just for you and your group of folks and you know what they like and someone that you didn't invite show up. What happens then? What happened? Are you going to sit around and talk about, mm, they're going to go tell pastor everything is going on here. Who told First Lady that we was getting together here? Now she know and we got to invite her next time. Right? How do we react to uninvited guests? Right? I think about the Solid Rock missions and hospitality. Amen. And no matter what goes on, there is always leftovers. It seems like those teams are, are willing to bet somebody gonna stop by that needs some food amen somebody gonna come late you know they might see a family you know walking down the street they making plates for making sure we have enough to take to the sick and the shut-in amen be prepared in season and out of season for an opportunity to minister so if you didn't invite me but i happen to show up so you out you might be out at kincaid's and i just show up with my kids but i wasn't invited to the party and shouldn't have knew about it are you going to invite me to sit down and fellowship with you all party crashers absolutely amen i see someone said dismissive 
I don't want to, I don't want you to be dismissive. I want cake too. Amen. So think about that and think about how we look and we judge folks. Those that are saints and those that are not. And this one is for me. So I'll go through this one and I know I just have a few minutes, but this is one that is for me. Smell the roses. Luke 10, 38 um, through 42. And this was with Mary and Martha uh, when Jesus was um, among them. Amen. And again, go back and read these um, because here the problem wasn't the work, right? Mary's issue wasn't that Martha was working. It was that Martha was so busy, she was going to miss the purpose in spending time with Jesus. So here's what to ponder here. Consider church events, right? Like I said, this is for me. It may not be for nobody else, but this is for me. Planning church events. Are you too busy to spend time with the people? I'm thinking about, you know, the health and back to school fair. That is a lot of work. I don't care if there's 200 of us working. It's a lot of work. And there's a lot of people that come to the community um, that seek our needs. The um, missions, that's a lot of work. Amen. And Sister Stevenson, I mean, she can communicate with those people, most of whom don't speak English as a first or second language. Amen. She knows them by face, some of them by name. There's those that will come around and just help her because they see that she needs help, those that are in the line, amen? So consider when you're planning, whatever it is, the appreciation. Um, oftentimes I see you know, pastoral care that are running around and getting things done. Be sure that you have time to be seated amongst the people that you can fellowship with the people, that you see those that you've invited, amen. I remember one year I invited all these people to um, come to a women's conference where I had a table. And I think I had maybe two minutes to say hello, running around and doing things. And that made me do a self-reflection, examine myself. I didn't wanna miss the purpose in that event, spending time with those that are spending time with Jesus, amen. It is absolutely important. Relationship builders, amen? Um, and consider your conversations. I know Luke 14, 1 through 24 is a lot, um, but there's two parables in there. And I think that they're very important. One is um, the parable of the lowly place, amen? When it's telling us to consider ourselves um, lower than those that we need to serve, to be servants, amen? And all of our high and might, and I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost, with a mind to run on and see what the end's gonna be, amen? With a mighty burning fire. We wanna make sure that we aren't too high to sit down and have decent conversations with the people. Here, Jesus' words were grounded. He was still teaching and a solid understanding of the word, a deep desire to bring the people into a right relationship with God. Are your conversations encouraging and biblical? When you're sitting down with people, when you're talking, when you're fellowshipping, when you're inviting these people to come into the church, are you being encouraging? Or are you looking at me, yeah, I know, she shouldn't have that tight shirt on or that tight dress, ooh, yeah, I know. He shouldn't have said that. I don't know why pastor keep doing that. What is your conversation? Again, we're learning to fellowship well. Do you know your word? Use what you know. You don't have to know the whole Bible. Oftentimes God will minister to you a word just for that person. You don't have to be a theologian or a preacher, but you do have to have a relationship with God because the reason we can even fellowship with each other is because we first have fellowship with Jesus Christ. Amen. And so any questions? I know um, I'm going to go through this and we have some homework. Um, but I think this one, uh, we talk about fellowship and the good fellowships and the good things that are that can happen in fellowship. Um, but there is also fellowship with cruel intentions. And I do want to read this one. I think I have four minutes. Can someone get Luke 22 and 21? Forgive the kids outside my door. 
Um, they are my joy. So they play outside from, I think, 8.30 to 9 or something like that. But Luke 22, 21. Does someone have that? But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Mm. Jesus knew Judas would betray him. He did not confront Judas in a way that would embarrass him. Of course, G Judas on the inside, you know, that took care of itself. Jesus still ate with Judas and encouraged Judas just as he did everyone else at the table. We are free because of Jesus's obedience and Judas' betrayal. I know some of us have a hard time. I, I hear the testimony sometimes with those that have betrayed you. I mean, that if you could think about someone sitting in your house, you are about to give everything that you have so that they have life. Someone so close. We talked earlier about that affection that we have for someone, someone you have affection for, that you're long suffering with, that you're bearing with, that you've forgiven even before they've done anything wrong. Kindness, humility, you're meek towards them. Because Jesus, I mean, he was all powerful, amen? He was both fully God and fully man. How do you behave when you know cruel intentions is sitting next to you in church? Wow. We talk about Judas's betrayal, but Jesus knew. Jesus still ate with him and he let Judas still stay there because prophecy had to be fulfilled. Um, I'll give you a, a scripture reference for the prophecy. Psalms 41 and 9 is just one of the scriptures where this was prophesied that Judas would per, per betray Jesus. But just think about it. Can we look at this scripture? Can we look in our own personal lives of someone that's betrayed us? And I know for me, it would bring me to tears right now with that forgiveness and that bitterness that I had. If I hadn't asked God to dig that junk out by the roots, I did not want that controlling my life anymore. I did not. I can only have one master. I can only serve one master. I can only serve Jesus Christ. I cannot serve bitterness. I cannot serve anger. I cannot serve frustration. I cannot hold a grudge. I need to serve God and God only. So think about that. How do you behave when you know cruel intentions is sitting next to you in church? Amen. Let's argue. What comments, questions, what do you have? I think it really speaks to a level of maturity, particularly sitting there with uh, the statement just jumped out at me, cruel intentions sitting next to you. Glory to God. And how do you act? How do you respond? How do you interact with them when you know there are cruel intentions sitting next to you. When Jesus said, the one who has his hand on the table is going to betray me. Well, Judas knew, obviously, because he's the one who had already set up the betrayal. Jesus did not point him out. And you know it's you, Judas. But rather, <laughs> he made the statement, and Judas already knew. Glory to God. But the power that Jesus had was operating under the Holy Spirit is also in us. And so how do we behave? when uh, cruel intentions are sitting next to us. Uh, that's heavy. It is. I saw someone type in the chat, smiling in your face, backstabbers. I know that song too. But we're learning to fellowship well. We're learning to fellowship well. And we have to be careful that those things that reminds us of what they did is necessary. It's necessary not to forget. It's necessary not to put your handbag down next to somebody that's taken from you before. But you still feed them. 
Amen. You still pray for them. We just went through before, you know, it is very hard to hold a grudge or dislike someone that you're constantly praying for. I hear the question, do I have to, you know, be close to them? Do I have to keep them in my space? You absolutely do not have to. You do not have to. If it will cause you to sin, be angry and do not sin. But you must forgive them. Consider those things that you must do. I do not have to hang out with my kid's father. I do not have to hang out with people who have not been delivered from hurting me and choosing to hurt me. I do not have to. What do I have to do? I don't want to focus on what I do not have to do, but what do I have to do? I have to forgive them as God has forgiven me. I have to put on love. This is a command. Colossians 3, 12, this is a command. 3, 12 through 14, this is a command. If I'm going to go around claiming that I am the elect of God, holy and beloved, I am commanded to put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness. Right? Can I dog walk that person in front of my house that they come out here and try to? Yes, I can. But meekness says I can't. God says I can't. I should be able to draw with love. I should be able, you know what? We're not going to do this right now. Amen. It's not going to turn out good for anybody involved. Above all things put on love. That's what they have the police for, right? That's what they have law enforcement for. But we have to forgive. We have to do that if we're going to grow. We absolutely have to do that. I see some comments. Amen. And First Lady Hand is raised. Oh, go ahead, First Lady. Amen. Praise God. I just wanted to add to that, you know, what you're saying is so true. It's the word. And the only way that we're going to be able to do what you say that we need to do, we have to know the word. We have to know. That's why I thank God for Bible study because iron sharpens iron. You want to be around somebody who can help you. You don't want to stay where you are. You want to mature in the word. And when we come to Bible study like we are now, we are learning these things. And if you, for me, if you really, really love the Lord, like you say you do, you want to be obedient to his word. So a lot of times if somebody mistreat me, it immediately comes to my mind, forgive them because they know not what they do. Because I, I just get, you know, because I just feel like they don't know what they're doing. I, they probably do know what they're doing, but inside of me. So I don't carry anything. So I can rise above it. I have to just talk to myself, you know, and be obedient to the word of God. Because one thing about the word of God, if you be obedient to it, whoever is mistreating you or talking about you or whatever, they're going to come back and they're going to apologize to you. Because you're letting the Lord fight your battles and you are not fighting your battles. And it's like heaping the words, it's like heaping hot coals that are on your head. You know, when, when you're just really just nasty to people. And, and I believe the word. I just believe the word. So once you really get that word down inside of you and when somebody do something to you, say something to you and you know that it's not true and you know that that wasn't right, it doesn't seem to bother you as much because you know that it's not true and you know what the word of God says. So I just want to say the whole key to this thing is right now what you're teaching us you know what you know what you're saying because the word is so powerful and the word convicts you you know if you really believe god and you do something that's wrong the holy ghost is going to tell you that you're doing it doing it's wrong the holy ghost is going to say to you so many times say to me she'll don't say that oh my god i already said it and Ho holy ghost say you you need to apologize i don't have a problem with it i am so sorry if I hurt you or offended you. It's all about the power of the word. It's all about the word. So this lesson is incredible, uh, Missionary Hunter, because the word is what's going to keep us. 
not what Papa say, not what Dad. The word is going to keep you. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Amen. Amen. There's so many scriptures. Thank you, First Lady. There's so many scriptures that are useful and lessons. I, I mean, just going through God's word, he opens up so many things about anger and bitterness and carrying that stuff with you. And at the end of the day, you have to decide who do you want to handle the situation, you or God. And I can assure you, brothers and sisters, that there is nothing that you can muster up in revenge or I'm going to get them back. There is nothing that you can come up with in your carnal mind that is going to be God's greater than God's wrath on those that mess with his children. I came into just this understanding that there was nothing I could do to anybody. And think about this. While you're holding that grudge against that person, what is the goal? The goal is to fellowship well. Fellowship well. If you're in the sanctuary and you're praying hard for that person that you think don't like you or that you have something against, pray and pray and pray and trust me, you are going to forget all about that ought. Amen? And when pastors say, go to your neighbor and pray with them or, you know, yell across the aisle, you're not going to have a hard time making eye contact with that person because you're praying for them. This lesson has so many tools to help you through this. Amen. But just think about that for those that are close to you, those that may not be in the church, those that you're thinking about right now, get a notebook, get a, a pen, a paper or something, get your phone, get, open the notepad, type down those that you are having a hard time with that have wronged you in some way. Something that you wake up and you think about, there is nothing that you can do to change what has happened to you in the past, but you can do everything about how joyfully you live your future. Thinking about God's wrath, God will take care of those that mess with his people. If you don't believe me, text Pharaoh. Ask Pharaoh what happened when he, God said, leave my people alone, let them go. And Pharaoh decided, I'm going to do what I want to do. Amen. You can go back through the Bible and look at all those that God said, stop, you know, text some of those that God opened the ground and ate them up. He told them about all of that, you know, sage and crystals and, you know, all of that junk. And they decided they were going to stay with it. I guess you'd have to open up the ground and go find them and ask them how that worked out and how they were treating the people that actually believe God. Amen. So, you know, that's enough for me tonight. I think I've gone over. Um, Homework. How can you develop heartfelt affection for a brother or sister you have a hard time being around? Amen. My heart is those of you that are co-parenting, and that is difficult because of that past relationship. Amen. That is just my ministry. Amen. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, got pregnant, did it again, done it again, bought the mug and bought a bigger t-shirt. Amen. How can you develop heartfelt affection for a brother or sister you have a hard time being around? That's your homework. Amen. And then next week, we're going to come back and we're going to close it out. Amen. We have learned so much in lesson one. You know, the purpose of the building, the purpose of the church, amen, the purpose of being physical, amen. Thank you for those of you who did homework and you came to the building this Sunday. It was so good to see those of you in Newark. I'm sure there were um, quite a few of you in the Tracy location. Thank you for doing that. Try it again this week. Come to the building, fellowship with us, and then just journal your testimony from what fellowship in the building did for you. And then next week, we'll use all of the homework from last week and this week and talk about weaponizing unity against the enemy. Amen. We're going to build a war chest. Amen. For our spiritual warfare, the weapons in our spiritual warfare, the biggest is unity. Amen. So that is all for me. Um, Pastor, back in your hands, what questions or comments do you all have?
Absolutely fantastic. And I'm sure uh, that many of us have, uh, even if we don't have comments or questions, that thing is rolling over in our minds and in our spirits. Amen. We've been challenged these last uh, couple of weeks. We've really been challenged to uh, determine whether or not we're going to let what we've been doing continue to be what you're, what you're going to do, or whether or not you're going to hear this and put it to work to make your life in Christ much more effective, that you walk more, much more steadily, more consistently with the Lord, not being carrying the weights of anger and the weights of separation from people, the weights of watching other folks and trying to be what they are or envying them for them being who they are and rather developing what God has called you to be and uniting with them, taking their, you know, they sing tenor, you sing alto, and y'all sang in harmony, amen, uh, because we're one body, many members of one body. God bless you. Would you clap your hands, give God praise for our instructor tonight. This was wonderful. Thank you, missionary uh, Hunter. It was absolutely powerful and thought-provoking and rich. Uh, this wasn't kindergarten stuff, glory to God. And uh, some of some of some folks are going to be you know, challenged, but that's what it's about to challenge you. Don't shrug it off. Don't sweep it under the rug. Don't say she wasn't talking about me. Because if you say she wasn't talking about me, she was talking to you. <laughs> that's the way that is. And so let's put it to work, all of us. Amen. Need a little help uh, growing through some things. God bless everybody tonight.